You're listening to the Results Driven Organizations podcast with Dr. Tanya Lowe, a podcast of curated conversations with C-suite leaders and those who support organizational growth and development. Get ready for inspiring interviews, educational lessons, and thought-provoking discussions that will challenge you to execute something new and innovative that will drive results in your organization. And now, here's Dr. Tanya Lowe. Hello, you're listening to the Results Driven Organizations podcast with Dr. Tanya Lowe using my results driven philosophy of strategy, leadership, teams, and customer experiences. I help organizations develop their best kept secret, their human capital. This podcast is designed to expand the conversation with C suite leaders and those who support organizational growth and development and what it really takes to create develop and maintain results-driven and high-performing organizations. Today, we are live at the Panoramic Experience in Atlanta, Georgia. We're doing an on-site podcast interview, guys. So tune in, grab a pen and some paper because our guest today is Jacqueline V. Twilly. Jacqueline is a passionate advocate for leadership, equity, and empowerment. As the CEO and founder of ZeroGap.co, she's dedicated to amplifying the voices of underrepresented leaders, especially women in male-dominated industries. She's the author of three influential books on career navigation, negotiation, and resilient leadership, founder of ZeroGap.co, focusing on empowering leaders featured in Forbes, Fast Company, and Black Enterprise, workshop leader, executive coach, can I say more, and conference speaker as we just finished listening to her be the keynote speaker at this amazing experience. Jacqueline's philosophy is rooted in the belief that true leadership is about character and impact, not just titles. She's committed to creating environments where everyone can lead with confidence and authenticity. Her approach to success emphasizes resilience and persistence, inspired by leaders like Ursula Brown. Through her work, Jacqueline provides practical strategies for navigating career challenges and breaking barriers in leadership. Jacqueline, welcome to RDO. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. I'm so excited to be on the podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. And we're live. Live at the Panoramic Experience. Live at the, in person, in the same room yes. together. So I love the work that you do. Thank you. And I think that it's important that we have this conversation and that leaders hear and understand this conversation around the wage gap, specifically around the wage gap for women, but specifically around Black women and women of color. Yes. So I'm going to jump right in. Let's go. You ready? Let's go. So uh, what is the current gap, pay gap, between women and Black women or other dem- in other um, groups in the workforce? I'd love, I'd love to start there to kind of set the tone. Yes. So earlier this year, Um, The report came out from the U.S. Department of Labor that said in 2023, Black women lost an astounding $4.27 billion in wages compared to white men. That's in one year. And this loss is largely due to job segregation, systematic barriers that funnel Black women into lower paying roles. And then with the pay disparity, on average, this is a stat that many people might be familiar with. Black women earn 69 cents on a dollar compared to their non-Hispanic white male counterparts for full-time year-round work. So the significant wage gap highlights the ongoing challenges that Black women face in achieving pay equity. And it's been over close to 60 years now where the equal pay legislation was signed in the White House. So we see how little progress has been made in that, yet there are signs of hope um, and there are glimmers that things can improve. So that's that's a snapshot on a high level. Woo, wait, wait a minute. I mean, you just hit me. You, you just came out the gate punching. <laughs> so let, let, let me back up. Let, 
job segregation. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that look like? So when we think back to the workforce and how the workforce was structured years and decades ago, we know that it was illegal for Black women to hold certain roles. I mean, it was just a few decades ago that women couldn't have a bank account with their own name on it or have a credit card. Right. So when we look at some of those systems that we've inherited from generations ago, we see the impact on the systematic barriers, such as job segregation, that funnel Black women into certain roles. Even today, we only have one Black woman leading as a CEO of a Fortune 500 organization. So it's very pervasive. And the systematic results of something that started decades ago, we're still seeing the impact of today. Wow. Wow. Inherited systems from years ago, you know, 30 yeah. years, 40 years, years, right? Yeah. Are still showing up today. Yeah, absolutely. Still showing up today. So what are some some key, what are some, some factors contributing to this disparity for, for women, but specifically for black women? Cause we're, we're talking about, um, women in general and is, are there differences between women in general and black women? Great question. So I want to go back to, I know that's a load. It's like a double question, but very relevant question. I want to go back to what you mentioned about job segregation. Yeah. Black women are disproportionately represented in lower paying occupations. For instance, Black women are 40 times more likely to be a nursing assistant compared to white men and four times more likely compared to white women. So despite making up nearly half of the workforce in the U.S. labor market, Women of color continue to experience substantial wage disparities that undermine their economic contributions because they are in those roles that are traditionally the lower paid roles. And we see that stat 40 times more likely to work as a nursing assistant than a white man. Right. That tells you right there that this systematic problem of funneling people into roles if I look at my own experiences in life, the pathway for the Black women I know who are nursing assistants to become a nursing assistant, that pathway is easy for them, right? Mm -hmm. Versus a pathway to go into another program where they might have more skills and training. Now, I'm very fortunate and I recognize my privilege that I know a lot of Black doctors, right. medical doctors, PhDs, neurologists, pediatric specialists, and those Black women have navigated significant hurdles. Unfortunately, again, these systems that we have inherited make it easier to go into the lower wage earning roles. You know, as you were talking um, in another light, I was a department chair for um, Health and Human Services for a technical college. And as I think about the number of black and brown mm -hmm. students that came through to be CNA, the CNA program yep. or the um, medical assistant program, now, not the med tech program, which is going to put you in a higher, you know, uh, income bracket, you know, because the students in that program looked very different from the students in um in the CNA program, in the in the the medical assistant program, but they also even in their 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 program experienced challenges when it came to internships and in all of that. So how how does the how does education level impact the pay gap for women? So black women face significant barriers in accessing higher paying fields due to educational attainment something that's called sorting and limited vocational training opportunities. As you just said, Black women are less likely to graduate with degrees in high demand fields like math and science. Now we know Black women are a part of the highest educated segment in our country, attaining lots of master's degrees, even PhDs, but what we're seeing is that they're not getting those degrees 
in the fields that are paying the most. When we look at those STEM fields, the math, science, um, engineering, we're not, and technology, we're not seeing those advanced degrees in those areas. And so there's an, a, a direct correlation between the highest paying roles and those STEM degrees and those of the what the Black women are currently achieving. So we see that gap is pretty significant. Wow. Wow. You know, so so that just leads me to my my next question, which is, you know, what do we do about it? Right. Yeah. So I know there's been a lot of talk with uh, different companies talking about, you know, removing it, uh, degrees as a barrier mm -hmm. for people to, you know, get into some of the the you know, better jobs that it is going to um, give them more opportunity. I still see that as a, I, I don't know if I see that as a, a help or a hindrance. I still believe that education, some, whether it's technical, mm -hmm. college, certification program, I still feel like we need the minority uh, black and brown people need a piece of paper. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? When I hear you say that, I think about uh, Papa Pope from Scandal, right? <laughs> Sitting on that bench telling Olivia, you got to be twice as good. Right? Yeah. So, yes, degree attainment is necessary. And again, with Black women, degree attainment isn't the issue. It's the area in which we're mm -hmm. receiving the degrees and the advanced degrees. So the first thing that we do about this is awareness, right? Like we were talking earlier, just the exposure to what's available. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, really looking at data scientists, and looking at analytical skills, looking at engineering, for instance, and really honing into that. Now, those aren't the only ways to get into the technology, but we know those are the jobs with the 200 plus, 300, 400 annual salaries. Yeah, AI. Right? <laughs> even, yeah, even prompt engineering. Yeah. There are certificates on prompt engineering using generative AI and training those systems on how to, to work for us. So with that being said, that's one of the ways that we can address that the other thing is we have to start young mm -hmm. there's so much research that shows us that girls at a young age for some reason are told they're not good at math yes which is not true yeah listen and i saw this thing going around the internet a few months ago talking about girl math like mm -hmm. and it, it was meant to be funny but i saw the societal issue in yeah. dumbing down how women do math like Black women in particular, we can make a dollar out of 15 cents. Yes, we can. We can make it stretch. <laughs> right. Math isn't our issue, right? It's not that we dislike math. Even at, here at the Panoramic Experience, there was this phenomenal financial literacy panel. Mm -hmm. It's about access to information and also removing barriers of shame. Right. So I saw some research a few years back that said, in a classroom setting in elementary age kids, the teacher would tell the students, raise your hand to answer this question. The girls would raise their hand, the boy would blurt out the answer, and the teacher would say, great job, John, right? And the girl is sitting there patiently waiting to speak. We see that in the workforce today. It translates into adulthood, mm -hmm. okay? And so when we think about these areas where we go to gain advanced degrees, it is a matter of teaching young girls that you don't have to wait for permission to pursue. Yes. Yes. You do not have to wait for or ask for permission. Somebody listening needed to hear that. Yeah. They're waiting for that opportunity instead of creating an opportunity. They're waiting for someone to recognize them instead of recognizing themselves as uh, recognizing their own genius. Shirley Chisholm said it best. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Bring a folding and bring your own table. Period. Period. I love it. I love it. Jacqueline, what, what can leaders do? You know, what can leaders do? People in... Well, you know what? I, I got a couple of questions before I get to the leadership question, because okay. I, I want you to, to um, I don't understand this. So I, I know people listening may not understand it. What is the difference 
between, so we've been talking about the wage gap and the uh -huh. statistics and everything. What's the difference between wage gap, wage loss, pay disparity? There's a lot of language here. There's a lot of language here. Yes. So, because I think we need to set the tone with that before we go into what leaders can do, because they got to understand what it is they need to do. Yes. Okay. Great <clears throat> question. So wage loss refers to the total amount of money that Black women collectively lose in potential earnings compared to what they would have earned if they were paid the same as non-Hispanic white men for work. So that total amount from 2023, collectively, Black women lost $42.7 in wages. That significant loss is due to, again, the job segregation. But when we look at the wage loss, wage loss looks at the total number financial loss for the whole category of people. The pay disparity focuses on the percentage difference earnings between Black women and non-Hispanic men. And the reason why this is important is because it highlights the broader economic impact on the entire population. So the pay disparity illustrates the relative earning difference on an individual basis highlighting personal financial inequity and challenges in achieving the pay gap. So when we understand both wage loss and pay disparity, it's crucial in addressing the economic challenges faced by Black women. Again, wage loss provides a macroeconomic perspective showing the vast collective financial impact due to systematic barriers, and the pay disparity offers the micro economic impact focusing on the individual earnings gap that Black women face compared to their non-Hispanic white male counterparts. Now, I want to underscore why do I say non-Hispanic white male counterparts? Yes, yes. Because when we're looking at data and we're looking at the statistics, we need to make sure that all of the data over a significant period of time is based on the same factors. Otherwise, we're not able to have an educated conversation of saying, this is the facts. Right. Mm. So we need to have that benchmark of what we're comparing these wages to. And this way, when research is done by different labs, scientists and organizations, data scientists, they're able to use the same benchmark so that we're able to measure progress or regression of progress. Wow. Wow. So I, I think that definitely lays the foundation for my next question. OK, <laughs> so what can it, I'm a leader uh, in an organization. What can I, what can I do? What can I do as a leader in an organization? One of, another one, you asked all the right questions. Okay. <laughs> Cause I want my leaders listening to this. Yes. You know, yes. I, I already know, you know, I already know somebody's going to be saying, well, why are they just talking about black women? You know, we're, cause we talk about black women, but it affects women in general. Yeah. So, um, Latino women and native American women suffer an even greater wage loss, mm. right? We're talking 41 cents on a dollar for Latino women compared to the non-Hispanic white male counterparts, right? But yet, when we go to the store, we're paying the same amount for basic things, right? Right, right. So you you do see that disparity. But what can leaders do? Well, can it's, it's, wait, before we get to what can leaders do, I want to go back and talk about that because, okay, here's a position. Mm -hmm. There's a a range, right? A salary range. Mm -hmm. The range is at seventy five k to one hundred and twenty k. You don't know who's going to apply for that position. So are you telling me that? I apply for the position uh, and so they're going to automatically start me out maybe at the lower end in spite of my... Interesting question. Okay. <laughs> so remember a few minutes ago, I talked about job segregation mm -hmm. and job sorting. Mm -hmm. Busy professionals want to learn on the go? Start with Audible. Our RDO guests often recommend must-read books. Now you can listen to them anywhere, anytime. From leadership insights to industry trends, Audible has it all. Get 30 days free and turn your commute into a learning opportunity. Visit our show notes to claim your free trial. Audible, your personal growth companion. Because great leaders never stop learning. Now, back to the show. Mm -hmm. So where we see the biggest disparity is that, again, I want to go back to the nursing assistant yes. example. Yes, please. Black do. women are, are sorted 
societally mm -hmm. into the lower wage job. So it's not necessarily you see the pay range and they're automatically discriminating and saying you're going to get 60% less, 40% less. Mm -hmm. That's not the, the automatic reflex. The pay gap and the wage disparity is very complex. There's a lot of different factors that go into it. When I started doing this work over a decade ago, when I realized how complex it was, yeah. Part of me felt overwhelmed. Like, how are we ever going to make progress? Because there's so many contributing factors. Mm -hmm. It's not just discrimination. It's not just job sorting. It's also access to family paid and medical leave. Mm. We know that women are often the caregivers, yes. not just for children, but for elders, right? Policy, legislation, et cetera. There are all these factors. And then some of it is unexplained. So um, to your point about, is it automatically going to be, you're going to be paid a percentage lower? Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're going into a segregated job role, perhaps, but here's what leaders can do. And you see a lot of states, legislation and companies starting to act on pay transparency, right? Letting people know upfront what the role is. Yes. There's a lot of legislation that has been passed over the years that said you can no longer require a candidate for a role to disclose their previous job salary. Mm -hmm. Part of why that's important is because if we know people have been significantly and traditionally underpaid, we perpetuate those systems if we're going to pay them based on what they earned prior versus paying them the market rate. Now, what leaders can do is take a page out of Mark Benioff's book from Salesforce. Mark Benioff and Salesforce a few years back did an audit on pay and they brought all of the women up to parity based on their roles. And then it was millions of dollars that they spent to right size everyone. Right. As Salesforce acquired companies over the years, they did another audit for all of the companies that they had acquired. And again, they right-sized investing millions of dollars. So if you want to look at an example of a company who has been leading in pay transparency and pay equity, Salesforce is one of those examples. And that's what a lot of leaders can do if you want to start the ball rolling is you got to get serious about it, right? And and recognize that it's going to cost you money. And if we're being real- Yeah, they make an investment. <laughs> if we're being real, some companies don't have that amount of money to make that investment to right-size people. So we can't just say like, oh, pay me this money. If the money ain't there, the money ain't there. Right. Right. Depending on what those disparities look like. But honest conversations, courageous conversations about this is where we're headed. Mm -hmm. This is a pathway forward. And different companies can take different approaches if that budget isn't there. I mean, you and I, we're leaders and the leaders listening. We know we, we try to make those budgets work. Um, when you're looking at something so significant, it can be a factor where you have to um, really get honest about how you position your business moving forward to still be profitable and operate and right-size people if that's necessary. But one of the basic steps to take today is to do a pay audit and then start being transparent about roles and what those roles are budgeted for. Wow. Wow. I hope that you all are taking notes. <laughs> I hope you're taking notes. Um, a pay audit. Mm -hmm. That is, that's interesting. I bet it's very telling. So if you look at, a, if you conduct a pay audit and you look at the data, right? Yeah. That's out there. It, it's probably going to be glaring. And I, unfortunately, I know some leadership, it would make them just, I'm going to put my head back in the sand because it's too much. It's overwhelming. For some people, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to start somewhere. Exactly. You have to start somewhere. Jacqueline, you wrote a book, Don't Leave Money on the Table. Um, can that book help women negotiate better for salaries and, and benefits? Absolutely. So I wrote Don't Leave Money on the Table after teaching negotiation classes for years in person and virtual. And so what I've done is taken the best practices from all of the clients that I've worked with and put it into an easy format where you can prep for a negotiation within a weekend. Mm -hmm. Now, with the Don't Leave Money on the Table book, I introduced the framework latte. Latte, I love a good latte. Yes, yes. 
And listen, we all know we can customize our lattes, right? Yes. You want it with this type of milk, you want flavor, sugar, no sugar, whatever, have it your way. Yes. Now with latte, a lot of people feel uncomfortable talking about money, especially women. So I wanted to make it approachable. Mm -hmm. So latte stands for look at the details, anticipate the challenges, think about your walk away point, mm. talk it through and evaluate the options. And with this book in particular, what we're doing is telling women how to set yourself up for a success in a negotiation. There's a lot of factors contributing to the wage gap that as individuals, we have no control over. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. As we mentioned, these systematic structures that have been set up for decades and decades as an individual, I might not be able to impact that. But what I can do is make sure that when I receive an offer, I'm advocating for myself. And a part of your question earlier, speaking of the pay range, is that you need to know where you fall. What is the market rate? right? Mm -hmm. Are you a competitive candidate? Do you have advanced skills that will add more value to the company to help you get that higher end of the range? So in the book, Don't Leave Money on the Table, we walk through how to do market research. What tools do you utilize so that you can gather the right information? And this is not a simple Google search. What is the salary for XYZ position? Right. Right. So we, we dive deep into that. And then we go through phrases and techniques that you use throughout the negotiation process, including if you need to walk away, if the offer isn't what you want. And this is often the most difficult thing for people to do, because earlier when I was teaching negotiation, I couldn't wrap my head around how women would be so well prepared in our sessions with the role play, et cetera. And then they get a low ball offer and feel like the negotiation failed. Wow. The negotiation didn't fail. You're actually successful if you stand on the value you bring to the company and you don't take less than what you're worth. That's not a failure on your behalf. That is a recognition that you're not playing into a system that perpetuates a cycle of inequity. And I know for many women, it could be scary to walk away. Absolutely. But it's, if you know, you can take that, that opportunity and have headaches for the next three years because you're still struggling. You still can't. Let me tell they you. They don't value you all of the, whatever you put into the, the yeah. pie. And so it's, it's better to walk away. So Brene Brown has this phenomenal quote from her book, The Gifts of Imperfection. Yes. She says, I'm paraphrasing this, but choose discomfort over resentment. And I remind my clients of that when I'm walking them through a negotiation prep. Yeah. Have the discomfort in that moment to have those difficult conversations and to stand on the value that you know you bring instead of having resentment that you're not being paid and you're not being treated fairly. Like we have to take control of the only thing that we can control and that is making sure we advocate for ourselves when that offer is provided to us absolutely absolutely Jacqueline this has been amazing it has definitely been an education for me what are you reading that we should be reading okay so I am reading difficult conversations mm -hmm. it is actually a negotiation book <laughs> Um, and I am constantly investing in my own professional development. So I'm currently enrolled at the Harvard Law School, um, taking a mediation and dispute resolution course. So this is a required book for my class. Okay. Um, the book is by Douglas Stone, Bruce Patton, and Sheila Heen. Well, let me tell you what I just finished. Okay. I just finished reading 12 Notes by Quincy Jones. And I did not know... Quincy Jones life story and the level of serendipity that happened in his life for him to step into the musical genius that he is mm -hmm. I love autobiographies oh my goodness wow 12 notes highly recommend wow wow why why should leaders read those books so I read a stat I think it was from Forbes a few years ago that said the most successful CEOs read 11 books a year yes yes, yes. right so I'm looking for things that are going to help give me that competitive edge in my field. As a founder and the chief leadership officer at Zero Gap, 
if I'm not committed to growth, how can I tell anyone else to be committed to their professional development? Absolutely. So for 12 Notes, what I love about that book that leaders should know is that you're going to deal with challenges and you can overcome them. And what difficult conversations, let's be real, as leaders, that's all day, every day. All day, every day. So so that's why you got to read it. That's why you got to read it. Oh my God. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We've been chatting with Jacqueline V. Twilley, CEO and founder of ZeroGap.co. Visit the show notes to see how to connect with Jacqueline and grab her books. Be sure to grab a copy of the um, Results Driven Organizations, the Four Key Star High Performance Workplace, and grab our special gift to you for being a valuable listener. Until next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Results Driven Organizations podcast with Dr. Tanya Lowe. Be sure to review the show notes for the resources mentioned and don't forget to grab your free gift available at freegiftfromtanya.com. Until next time.